Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to Misinformation in Science and Society. Here to listen, not to judge. I'm your host Annie and today with us we have Tara Kirksell who is an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University. Hi Annie, sorry I'm a little late. Hi, you're good. How are you? I'm good. All right, so let's get started. Could you please um, introduce yourself and what do you do? Hi, well, yeah, I'm Tara Kirksell. Um, I'm associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I'm also a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And so I work, um, I've work. i worked for the past 12 years um, on issues related to health security, and that's broadly the intersection of public health and national security. And there's a lot under that umbrella, um, you know, from pandemic preparedness to nuclear consequence management, um, community resilience uh, to disaster. Um, and uh, more recently, I've worked a lot on risk communication. And a lot of that, um, if you've worked on risk communication for the past few years, you've had to sort of look and deal with mis and disinformation um, in the health related sphere. So um, that's what I've been doing recently and a short description of my background. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So why did you choose this career like initially? Well, I have, I think, I think it's an interesting sort of journey to my, my current career. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, actually was a professional athlete um, before I joined <laughs> academia. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I swam, uh, my under, I, I did my undergrad at Stanford and I swam. Then I went to the 2004 Olympics um, swimming and I got a silver medal for the US um, on the relay, uh, medley relay. And um, so I swam professionally for a few years after that. And then when it was time to retire from that first career, um, I sort of was thinking, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and I had gotten um, my undergrad in St at Stanford was human biology mm -hmm. and my master's, I went state, had sort of stayed and gotten a master's degree in anthropological sciences. And I really loved this class that um, my advisor had taught called Contagion and Conflict. And we learned about this um, exercise had been done called Dark Winter. And it was about um, an anthrax attack um, on the US and how people should you know think about dealing with it. And I thought it was so interesting and so when my then boyfriend, now husband's um, roommate's dad took me out to dinner one time, all of us out to dinner and mm -hmm. um, said, what are you going to do with your life, Tara? And I said, well, I don't know, but I really like this thing. And he said, I know the people who made that exercise. And so he said, let me get you in touch with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was kind of like my like fairy godmother. And in the meantime, was like talking to them saying, you should hire this person. And so um, turn, so I talked to them and um ended up getting hired as an entry level analyst at the, then it was the center for biosecurity and you know started out uh you know it was a big change from what i had been doing um in the past um you know starting at an entry level position you know i had to like count paragraphs so that the references were right um mm -hmm. and cold, cold call congressional staffers to try to invite them to our events um and so it was you know an exercise and, you know, getting back to basics and being able to do the grind and um, do the hard work that's not that glamorous. Um, and I worked um, on that for a while. And then um, when I, um, you know, I came to the point, realized uh, in the think tank world, you can't make, uh, you can't make that much progress without a terminal degree. So I decided to go to Johns Hopkins to get my PhD. And then when I finished it, um, our center was actually moving to Johns Hopkins and I ended up getting my faculty position and so um yeah that's how I got to where I am that is actually so cool yeah and like yeah so what is like the favorite part of like doing what you do um I think the favorite my favorite part is um working with students um and talking with students on um like you know I have an online class and we have these live talks um and so great getting to interact with students Mm -hmm. um, you know, my research is interesting, but I think it's even more interesting when students become really passionate about the research that they, you know, and they're, they're getting involved and they're doing it. Um, and, you know, I can sort of, you know, that excitement is, um, uh, you know, it's kind of transferable. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's my favorite part of my job. Yeah. Um, so why do you think truth is like so important and why do you think, uh, misinformation is such like a big issue right now? Well, misinformation is a huge issue right now because 
uh, you know, messages that are or rumors or narratives that are misleading are causing people um, to um, undertake activities that cause them harm or neglect to do things that they should do that would protect them. Um, I think it causes a lot of distrust and division um, and makes it so that people can't um, sort of talk together about certain issues. Um, the politicization um, and division that have grown uh, through mis and disinformation has been terrible for our country and terrible for us um, in trying to get out of this pandemic. Um, now, I try to be careful about saying like something's true and something's false because um, you know, there's a lot of, first of all, gray area. A lot of times it's in the interpretation, you know, there's a fact and it's the interpretation of that fact that either leads you to a correct conclusion or a, or a misleading conclusion. Um, and science evolves over time. So what, you know, like sometimes in my presentations, I show, show, show a picture of me um, testifying to Congress in March, 2020, and no one in the room is wearing a mask. Um, because at the time, masking was not something that, you know, had been proven to be effective. And over time, science sort of evolved in ways that said, oh, masking actually can help, um, you know, protect people from COVID-19. It's probably a good idea in indoor crowded situations, which <laughs> congressional hearing is. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, the fact that science evolves over time, um, you know, means that, um, you know, our truth. Um, can change over time based on facts and having our scientific community and public community being open to changing our minds when pre we're presented with new evidence, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So would you say there's a lot of like misinformation in like kind of what you do? And like, if so, like, how do people in the field like try to tackle or like avoid it? Sure. Well, there's a ton of mis and disinformation and, um, you know, related to health emergencies in particular, uh, COVID-19, it's been very, very bad. Um, I think people are just starting to sort of think about how to tackle the issue. And in fact, the science is not, uh, you know, it's a relative, people have known about mis and disinformation for a long time, mm -hmm. but the solutions I think are still a little bit unclear. Um, yeah. And so people are trying to sort of, you know, help with fact checking, help with digital, um, health and digital literacy, um, community-led um, efforts to sort of have trusted community members um, telling people about um, different information. So like in Maryland, there's a barbershop um, initiative where, you know, um, people who are cutting hair talk about, you know, they, they've been educated um, by public health professionals to provide um, true information about vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, there can also be efforts um, to listen um, which is, I think is a lot of times a, a gap um, that is not filled that to listen to what the concerns are and what the rumors are and what kind of narratives need to be pushed back on. Mm -hmm. um, but this also overlaps with um, mis and disinformation outside of the public health sphere. And that's a pretty big issue. Um, one that I don't really try to tackle um, because, you know, when um, pu public health gets um, intertwined with politics and these larger narratives about big government, big pharma, you can't trust, you know, anyone, um, they're coming to take away your freedoms. Um, you know, that is a larger issue. And I think something that, you know, public health is not really qualified to tackle on its own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think the worst type of misinformation is like about what? Oh, it's really hard to say because <laughs> there's different, there's bad um, mm -hmm. and very, there, okay, so not all mis and, mis and disinformation is harmful, right? Some is just there, it's wrong, oh well, right? But yeah. there are other things that like we can see that some, there are some real harms to mis and disinformation, right? So we, we bend things into different areas, right? So one of those is false cures. False cures can be harmful because um, you know, it can, you know, someone says like, oh, I'm eating garlic, I'll be fine. Um, and they can take riskier actions than they really should should be taking. Um, people can say, I'm going to take this drug that um, the regular science field says doesn't work, but I believe it works. And they can waste time, which, they, you know, they could have been using a drug that does work that would have saved their lives, but they wasted that sort of window of opportunity on something that didn't work. Oh. Or they can take a false 
cure that's dangerous to them that can kill them. Um, so, you know, just in the false cure category, there's that in, in, um, you know, another category of, that we have of scapegoating, right? There can be really dangerous and harmful things that come out of scapegoating. I think, um, you know, uh, in the Asian American community, uh, my mom is Chinese, you know, for a long time, she was scared to go to the grocery store at night because of all these attacks on um, Asian Americans um, coming out of that scapegoating um, with COVID-19. Um, you know, we see just regular, um, you know, uh, false information about the disease or the cure, right? COVID's not real. People don't take protective measures or there's like something like a microchip in the in the vaccine, which we know is not true. Um, you know, people can then be prevented from doing you know, something that would save their lives. Um, and then this last category that we have, which is um, conspiracies, including profiteering. Conspiracies and profiteering really, uh, accusations of profiteering really do a lot to undermine trust and make it so that, you know, when um, there are recommendations um, for people to, to do things that would help them, um, you know, people just don't trust enough to do them. Um, and overall, you know, that that can bleed into other things outside of the health arena and outside of a vaccine for COVID. But then also, you know, like down the road, childhood vaccines against like measles and all these other diseases that have in the past been eliminated in the U.S., um, people may stop using doing those vaccines and then we may see those diseases come back in the U.S. So many different harms. I can't really say which one's the worst one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I know we like touched on this a little bit before. What do you think about the invention of like technology and its like, impact on misinformation? Yeah, so social or so mis and disinformation, uh, I think I mentioned has have, has been around for a long time, right? Um, I sometimes in my presentations I so show a cartoon from the 1930s, which is about misinformation and all these people who aren't getting vaccinated get smallpox um, mm -hmm. because of misinformation. Um, so it's been a long round for a long time. You know, there was Operation Denver, which was a disinformation campaign um, created by the Russians um, about uh, say, basically saying that the U.S. had created HIV/AIDS. Um, you know, these things have happened for a long time, but they have so much more power now those misinformation and the disinformation campaigns, they have so much more power because of social media and because gatekeepers on information don't really exist anymore. Before it used to be, hey, it's got to go through an editorial room um, if that has a number of standards about, you know, trying to um, make sure that that their reporting is fact-based. Mm -hmm. and, and there aren't those gatekeepers when it comes to social media and other sort of um, uh, information sharing platforms. Um, and so it can me it means that there are opportunities for mis and disinformation to spread much more quickly and um, and become much more pervasive. And for these larger narratives, so not just the rumor, but the larger narratives to gain sort of strength um, and power, just kind of I feel like it's kind of like a hurricane over warm water, right? It's just ripe for more things and just this narrative to get stronger and people just get sucked up into it mm -hmm. uh, and have a hard time escaping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you, yeah, what do you think will be like the best way to like eliminate or avoid or reduce um, misinformation? So our team put together a national, a call for a national strategy to combat mis and disinformation. It has four main pillars, right? Mm -hmm. One is to just bring all those stakeholders together, right? It's like, it's not just social media companies that are going to fix this. It's not just government. It's not just civil society. It's everyone together. Mm -hmm. um, so it's bringing everyone together and having people decide this is a real problem and then we're going to do something to fix it. And we're going to have everyone bring their resources into it. But also it's controlling that mis and disinformation and the sources of it, right? And to feel, to say, you know, we're going to do what it takes to try to reduce the circulation of this, mm -hmm. um, you know, go after the people who are spreading it, um, which you have to be careful about because, um, you know, that can really be weaponized. You mm -hmm. need to be able to have definitions for it that are not created by the government um, because, you know, that can also be weaponized depending on who's in charge. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you need to be able to have ways to go after um, misleading information and for social media companies to do their part. Um, but you also need to um, inc promote good information so that people are, are armed with, um, you know, good information when they're, when, um, you know, they to help combat this false information. Mm -hmm. And then I think the most important, but the most difficult is that you need to increase public resilience to mis and disinformation. So this is training people to um, think critically um, using appropriate methods and sources um, to use um, technologies that help uh, 
um, sort of determine, uh, you know, what what are good sources, um, and um, to sort of to make it so that because we know that we'll never be able to get rid of all mis and disinformation, that when people see it, it just rolls off them like water off a duff, duck's back. Um, that they can be resilient to it when they see it. Um, and it doesn't affect them. Um, and I think that this is the hardest and we know social behavioral change is the hardest, but I also think we can take some lessons from tobacco and the public health fight against tobacco, which I think in the US has been fairly successful to, um, you know, it takes a long time, but you can turn the tide, um, you know, culturally against a big problem. Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, I will say the, the tobacco thing also is, is compar comparable because, um, you know, tobacco, um, you know, their product was doubt. Right, they they to push back against a body of facts. They created doubt. Mm -hmm. This is kind of what we're tackling right now. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think those are pretty good points. Um, that's all my questions about misinformation. Just for fun, do you have like a role model? Yeah. So um, well, my role model. Um, I actually was lucky enough to work with my role model, D. A. Henderson. He was the man who led the WHO smallpox eradication campaign. Um, and he, so he, he, he was the person who made it so smallpox isn't a problem for us anymore. And yeah. I got to work with him because he had started our center. And he died a few years ago. But um, you know, how lucky am I to have gotten to work with my the person I looked up to the most? Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just to close this out, do you have any advice for people, especially like teens? Sure. Um, so I think that the, um, for teens, I think, first of all, keep studying hard, uh, you know, start thinking about the things that you're interested in and how you can be passionate about them and bring your energy to that area. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, um, those of you who are interested in biology, I think some DIY biology labs are pretty cool. Um, they're available in many different cities um, where people can sort of explore the explore biology kind of, um, you know, almost like a garage, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a garage type of thing, um, mm -hmm. but it's pretty sophisticated still and really cool. And then I would say as you go along, um, you know, don't be afraid to get in and grind on some of the, you know, these difficult things. I think many people, you know, think I'm going to jump in and I'm going to, uh, you know, my first year in the job, I'm going to publish something in science. And, um, you know, sometimes it takes, um, you know, proving that you can do the work mm -hmm. and that you're willing to, to get to, you know, get into the trenches to make a big difference, um, you know, that gives you those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. All right. Good luck with everything. Oh, thank you. Bye. Right. Bye.